Hello, class, Professor Havens here. In this video, I wanted to start chapter one uh, and also give you a little bit of insight on how I'm designing lectures and just a little bit of uh, instruction before we get into actual class time. So uh, notice that when you go into Canvas, there should be uh, at the very top of each lecture, a link to the resources I'm using in the videos. So basically you can find all the slides that I use here. Uh, you can also find the packets or the lecture notes I reference. Uh, and so, uh, what I recommend doing with these is usually what I, I print these out for my students uh, and I distribute them all at the beginning of each chapter just as a resource always I, I tell them it's always optional it's not graded or anything it is some it's just a way to keep notes um, in a more organized fashion it has a lot of theorems and properties and stuff on it so you don't have to necessarily write down every little thing I'm saying because there's a lot of information um, and I'm trying to emphasize the most important information but if you want you can print this out uh, and follow along. And basically what I, what I will do sometimes in the videos, I'll say, pause the video and try out this question on your own, or, uh, and then I'll walk through it as well. So it's kind of an opportunity for you to practice, see if the concepts are making sense. Uh, and then if not, you can continue watching the video or just use the, the you know, I'll, I'll then solve it on, um, on the YouTube video. Uh, and you can kind of check yourself, see, did I do it right? And if something did go wrong, you kind of compare with my methodology. Or you can just watch the videos, uh, work on it after. But the reason why I think this is important is uh, there's been a lot of research on mathematics education. Uh, and actually writing and thinking and doing math yourself is very, very, is, is shown to be very important. Obviously, you can listen uh, and understand the general concept, but you don't really know how well you understand it until you try to do it yourself. Uh, and that's why I'm I'm giving all this. So in these packets, they have they often have all of the you know relevant terms, and they have a bunch of practice problems. There's also some group activities because usually I will do group activities in a live classroom setting. Uh, but what you could do with those group activities is uh, actually work on them in groups if you want, or just work on them individually. Um, again, you can do this however you want. It's this class is online, so um, the method. Sorry, my dog is being very cute in the background and he's distracting me. Um, but yeah, so anyways, let's let's actually get into chapter one. Uh, and I'll, I'm going to start with the slides and just walk through um, some of those uh, things. So, um, oops, I'm not even on the right slide. There we go. And again, you can find these, um, this as well, on Canvas under the slides. But chapter one is on the mathematics of elections and the paradox of democracy. So the main goal of this chapter is to look at elections in our society or in other societies. How do those work? What sort of math goes into them? And another goal is to try to understand, well, one thing, well, we're going to get into the US system as we work through the remaining chapters too, because it's a little, the electoral college system for presidential elections is a little bit more uh, complicated than, you know, the what we're going to be discussing in this particular chapter, but we'll, we'll kind of get to that and we'll build up a lot of the ideas that are important. Um, so to start with, uh, in the section one of chapter one is all about uh, the basic elements of a of an election. So I'll just start with some terms, uh, which are, I you know, I'm sure terms you're familiar with in this chapter, uh, but we'll def I'll define some things and kind of talk about um, a lot of the things that we're going to need. So uh, an election, as you can read, is um, ba basically how we make decisions collectively, right? Like as a society, if we want to figure out who should be our leader, who should represent our country, uh, we, we can hold an election to try to make that determination. Uh, and there's a lot of different methods of elections that, pe that people use across the world, and it's not always consistent to how we do it. Uh, and we're going to look a little bit at that, but we're going to mostly focus on, well, what is the math that goes um, behind that, obviously being in a math course. Um, and obviously it's, it's important that we have an ability as a society to, you know, elect someone to be our leader and not to just arbitrarily choose them. And another, you know, another point of emphasis that we're going to be focusing on as we look at the math is how do we make a fair decision? Like what's like, how, how can we select someone who is basically the best choice? How do we determine that? Um, uh, and one of the, in, in, the spoiler alert here, there, there isn't really a perfect system. And we're going to examine the math behind that as we work through the chapter. So we're going to be focusing on voting theory, which is just basically the study of uh, the voting methodology on the mathematical side and talking about what are different uh, methods of determining the winner of an election. 
um, and also the different, uh, you know, fairness of each of those methods. So additionally, each election, there have to be a set of candidates. Basically, what are we, what are, who are we choosing from? Like in a election for a representative, it would be probably a group of people and we want to choose the best person or we, sometimes we might elect more than one person depending on the circumstance to uh, be to represent us as well. But you can also hold elections and this is another common way that people will hold elections is like for objects. Like say we're trying to determine, let's say we were gonna have a class pizza party. Uh, this metaphor is not as good since we are not actually in class together, but, uh, and let's say that I as the professor wanted to determine, okay, what is type, what types of pizza we are gonna order? Let's say it was gonna choose four types of pizza. What I, I obviously I could just choose my four favorite types myself and just buy them for you guys. And, but that's not really probably the best way. What I could do is I could poll you guys uh, and ask you, you know, uh, what is your, are your favorite types of pizzas? And I could use your, the, all that data to determine which types to get. And there's a lot of different ways I could analyze that data. That's kind of the uh, um, the voting methodology that we're going to be looking at. The voter, the voter, or the voters are obviously who are making the decision. Who has a stake in the election? Like, uh, you know, in the you know, for electing a representative, it would be the people, and all those people would try to figure out collectively vote on who would be. Sometimes certain situations, voters could be in groups, it, like a you know a. a collection of people could have a single vote or multiple uh, different amounts of votes depending on the context and actually that's what chapter two is about weighted voting systems which would be a context in where people would not necessarily get the same number of votes in this chapter we're assuming everybody gets one vote uh due to the whole concern of fairness we want equal say between our people um the ballot is the device at which we make the decision so basically it's how we how we collect the data. So ballots in you know in the olden days would be done on paper where people could punch, you know, or it's like a multiple choice test where they would select their candidate or write in their choice um, in that manner. And they would go to, you know, an official polling station to uh, submit those votes. Uh, and there's always been historical problems with physical ballots and, you know, losing ballots or people submitting extra ballots or whatever happening as well uh, and more commonly these days we use electronic ballots basically like on the you know a computer or whatever where we could make our selections you know in electronic fashion which there's also a lot of claims that uh there's a lot of unfair things that happen with electronic balance because people can hack those data or data is lost or whatever you know or artificial data there's a lot of you know basically all ballots have their issues there's no perfect system but obviously electronic ballots are a lot easier for collecting data and analyzing that data in a mathematical sense because doing it all on paper was historically a huge issue and it took quite a bit of time to figure out okay who's actually going to win this election having to do look at millions and millions of actual physical ballots. Uh, and then obviously we want to know what's the outcome, what's going to happen, who's going to be elected, or what type of pizzas are we going to buy? Um, the outcomes could be, uh, there's a, you know, could be, well, this is in a later slide, but sometimes we want a single winner, like who's going to be the president or who's going to be the Senate, as, like if you could just have one senator. or But sometimes you could have multiple winners, like multiple senators or multiple different types of pizzas. <laughs> Uh, and we could rank them all like saying, okay, what's the top choice, second choice, third choice, and so on um, when relevant. But the, in, there's, a, there's a few different types of ballots which I wanted to briefly explain. We're gonna be mostly focusing on preference ballots for the sake of mathematical analysis, uh, and you'll see why in a minute. Um, but basically a single choice ballot is a ballot where the voter gets a single selection for, you know, who do you who they want to be president or senator or whatever. So like in these examples, uh, the instructions say vote for one option. So, you know, between these five fictional people, if we were trying to elect them, uh, say, for example, to be class president for our summer problem solving class. Um, we could... Uh, but, you know, we would we would get one selection. So I would vote for my favorite person. Cool. Um, and a lot of times, uh, like in the U.S., say in most most situations, they are single choice ballots. Like, say, for example, for voting for president, we, we can't like rank them. We, we have to select one. We don't get more than one choice. Uh, and, you know, there are some issues to single choice ballot, which, which we'll get to in a minute. Uh, and often in a single choice ballot, um, sometimes they give you the option to write in a candidate. 
because uh, they wouldn't necessarily have every selection and there's a lot more candidates like for certain for certain positions literally any um member of the, you know any um citizen of the united states could be elected so uh sometimes you have a whole lot of different candidates and sometimes you only have a certain number of choices um so one thing i would usually do if this was a live live class would have you guys actually participate in some uh fake elections just for fun um so what we're just going to pretend here but basically I, I would ask you guys of the following who do you want to teach class next week so you know instead of me coming to class or teaching uh these lectures on zoom if you wanted to me to be replaced who would you choose to replace me and basically you could select one person uh and typically leonardo dicaprio wins this uh vote but you know again i'm just i'll just pretend to have some actual data here but basically you know you make your choice cool uh, and really with single choice balance, there's not a whole lot of interesting math. Headset has this bad habit of turning itself off, uh, which I've tried to fix, but haven't been able to yet. Um, anyways, uh, well, I forget what I was saying, but basically the, the math that goes behind this is not that complicated, right? Say we have 50 students in class all voting on this whoever gets the most votes like say leonardo gets 20 votes sheldon gets 15 oprah gets 10 whatever jesus gets i don't know i'm just making up numbers here but i think you catch my drift well if everyone's getting a single vote we just count up the number of votes and that person is the winner and i think when most people think of elections and how they work that's that's the simplest simplistic nature uh, but there's, that's not the end of the story. So that's what I want. That's kind of what I'm getting to next. Is a preference ballot is a ballot where we're given multiple selections and we're allowed to rank our candidates in order of which order the most favorite. Like say for example, if there were five candidates uh, for and again another fictional class presidency, um, we could then select all of them and we could say, well, who's my favorite? Who's my second favorite? Who's my third favorite? And so on. And this would give us a lot more. Uh, you know, choice and selection. Now, preference ballots are often considered harder because the voter has to really know all the candidates and be well informed to be able to, you know, actually contribute to the data. So technically you don't necessarily have to rank them all completely. Now, it, again, it depends on the system. Or a lot of times how, I've, how a ballot would look would be something like this, where they list all of your choices and you have to rank them for a second, third, some, something in those forms. And it's called preference just because, you know, we're we're given the entire preference. Uh, we're, we're, we're allowed to fill out our entire list of preferences completely as opposed to single choice. And all the all the math we're going to be doing is going to be using data from preference ballots as well. Um, so for this would be another example I would give uh, as a poll to the class. I would ask, what's your what type of school is the best? And this would be different because I'm not going to I would not give you a single choice like you could just pick one. You would have to actually rank each one of these for first to last uh and then i would see you know what is it who, what's the best type of school um from the data usually what wins is college usually all y'all like college the best uh usually also preschool is pretty high uh because you know you get to nap in preschool um and usually middle schools like last place so again the data is usually fairly similar i've done this activity quite a few times so we'll just use our imagination um but it, it the the point of this is it's a little bit harder to actually rank them all because you'd have to fit, you'd have to actually pick who's my first who's my second who's my third who's my fourth who's my fifth and and actually kind of consider them all in comparison to each other also what i wanted to bring up with this example is well how does the computer actually determine the winner right because imagine 50 different of you guys all doing this activity at the same time and, and the ranking you know it's the computer's going to rank well college first preschool second whatever it's going to come up with this answer but how did it do that determine how did, how did it determine that because the computer got a lot of data it got 50 different people's choices one through five uh and if you count up the number of you know permutations of that there's you know a gajillion different ways that could have turned out uh, and that that this is pretty much what we're going to be looking at in this chapter is after we're getting all this data how do we then figure out the outcome uh, and also what, what I wanted to mention is technically there is not a correct answer to this. There's actually a lot of different methods for determining the outcome. And so when when we're taking election data, there's another facet to the selection of, uh, of candidates to the outcome. It's, it's not just dependent on um, the data, it's also dependent on the mathematical method. 
Um, and then just another thing to mention is a truncated ballot or a truncated preference ballot is just one where you're not given the full set of choices. Like, for example, I could ask you to rank your top three out of five. Or say in the United States, we have to select a person for president as our choice. Technically, you know, there's a bajillion candidates, um, but we're only allowed to select one. That, but we're in, you know, a lot of times we're not given the complete list. We're not allowed to choose anyone. We have to pick from five. And that's just what truncated means. So like another question I could ask you is what's the best type of ice cream? Uh, and this would be a truncated ballot because uh, obviously I can't necessarily give you every single choice. Like for example, if we we're trying to determine what type of pizza to order for class, um, you know, I can't necessarily list all types of pizza because there's way too many types to list. So I might select the top eight choices in general and then pull you guys on, you know, say I was going to bring three types of ice cream to class, um, you know, I could try to figure out, well, of, of these particular choices, uh, which one's the best? And also, just another thing to consider is it's technically, while you guys are making the decision and voting for this, whoever is creating the poll also has some influence in the outcome in the choices that they put in that actual poll, right? Because I could have listed all my favorite types of ice cream and left off some of the ones that other people like. Uh, but obviously someone who's trying to get real data would do as good of a job and think a lot about, well, what options would we actually provide? Um, but, you know, there, there's there, there's a lot of elements within this. And coming back to types of outcomes, a lot of times it will be winner only, but in your homework and online activities, you'll often be asked to rank them all too. So that's often what we'll consider when we're looking at the data in some actual examples. Um, we will often try to figure out a complete ranking you know, who's going to get first, second, and third. Uh, or like with, you know, certain um, awards, they might give different levels of awards, like gold, silver, bronze, or whatever. Um, one other thing just to bring up before we wrap this video up is, uh, like, sometimes ties are possible, right? Like, say we, we all were voting on the type of ice cream, and both vanilla and chocolate tied for first. So, and if we only had a winner only as our... Um, as our outcome, how would we make the decision? Like say we could only bring one type of ice cream to class, how do we break a tie? Uh, and this is an issue with the, in the real world that happens quite often. Um, and it really just depends. If you're gonna hold your own election, you'd wanna think about how you would handle a tie ahead of time. Uh, and in the US, it's like when you have millions of voters, it's really, really unlikely that it literally comes down to a tie. But it really just depends on how many people are voting. In smaller circumstances, it's much more likely, of course. Um, but uh, in, in certain cases, like uh, in 1969, Catherine Hepburn and Barbara Streisand both tied exactly for best, uh, for both best actress, and they both received the Oscar. So sometimes a tie, because they both had exactly the same number of votes, a tie could be handled just by, okay, why not? You can both have the award. You know, why have, why have to make a decision? It's not like those people have to hold a specific position, like an elected official, where, you know, a single choice would matter. Um, but, you know, uh, in, in 2017, uh, a city council member, there was a similar situation where they tied for the number of votes um, after all the balloting happened, uh, and they decided the outcome by a coin toss. They literally flipped the coin to see who's going to be the council member. Uh, and as a population, it's, it's a little bit uh, unideal to think about who's going to be your actual representative based on a coin flip, right? You'd like to think that there's more that goes into it, but sometimes we don't necessarily have a better way of determining when the data literally is that black and white. And actually, another thing I wanted to bring up as we work through the math is technically there are better ways of deciding than using a coin flip. You, you can use other methods to determine the outcome of an election, but often those systems aren't put in place. Um, there's sometimes people, there's other stories of elected officials drawing from a deck of cards and the high card wins. Or another way, which you can't see because my uh, face is in the way, is by runoff, uh, which is basically just like what, what will happen is they'll basically do do a re-vote. Re After the first vote is concluded, if it's a tie or if it's too close to make a determination, what you can do is redo the vote. Basically remove a lot of the candidates that had no chance of winning and kind of just focus on the, the remaining two candidates. If you want, when you run a runoff, sometimes you'll see one of the people actually gets a lot more votes. Uh, and we'll talk about how you do a calculated runoff uh, in section 1.4 as well. Um, 
And this video is getting a little bit too long, so I'd like to wrap it up. Last last little thing before we get into uh, the specifics is another thing that we'd have to consider is the voters, like in, in what system, who actually gets a vote? Do, are there equal level of votes, you know? Um, and in most countries, every, the in to preserve the ideal fairness criteria of the voting system, um, everyone gets a vote, right? Every, you know, member of this uh, society, every citizen. Um, and sometimes people think it's unfair that non-citizen residents can't vote, um, but it's it's kind of like a boundary line between, well, who's actually a member of this country and who is not? Because people who are in the country illegally or have not, you know, finished their citizenship process, you know, should they be able to vote or not? That's something where there there's still a lot of debate about that idea even today. Um, but in other countries, it doesn't necessarily work the same way. Some countries, the, the citizens don't vote, but instead it's like there's a legislature or there's a certain subset of people who actually get to vote, uh, which, again, you know, the idea of fairness is different in each society and each society has its reasons for doing things. Uh, and a lot of times uh, such situations are really a sham. There is technically an election, but it's it's guaranteed to come out to be the dictator or whatever uh, for, you know, for various reasons. So a lot of times elections can be held, but not really be meaningful because there is no real choice or it's not really fair based on you know, typical considerations. Um, and then some countries don't even have elections for their officials. They just have a head of state that's determined by monarchy or whatever. Um, and, you know, it's just the, the people who are in charge stay in charge and because they have been. So there's a lot of different systems. Um, but, you know, we're going to be obviously focusing on similar to our country where all the citizens get a vote. And that's usually the assumption. Like, say I was trying to uh, figure out what type of pizza to get for class. Um, I would want to make sure every one of you guys got a vote. Now, technically, you don't have to vote. And there's another another issue in societies is when the citizens don't actually vote. Or are we really getting good data either? Um, but anyways, obviously, everyone getting a vote um, is important. Let's wrap this video up. In the next one, I'll talk about what a preference schedule looks like and how do we read one.